Okay. Okay. So the distinguished TED colloquium today will be given by Lauren Williams, who is currently the Dwight Parker Robinson Professor of Mathematics at Harvard and the Stanley Starling Siever Professor at the Radcliffe Institute. Lauren has contributed to many areas of algebraic combinatorics, including the study of the asymmetric exclusion process, the theory of solitons, the positivity conjecture for cluster algebras, metroid theory, and more. In 2016, she won the Association for Women in Mathematics and Microsoft Research Prize in Algebra and Number Theory for her work on algebraic combinatorics. And today she will tell us about matroids, tropical geometry, and positivity. So thank you very much for the introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to give this um, Tut Distinguished Lecture. Um, I'm going to try to make my lecture very accessible. So if you do have questions, um, feel free to interrupt me or put something in the, in the chat. Um, let's see. Oh, sorry, I'm having trouble switching to the next slide for some reason. Um, okay, so here's the plan for my talk. I'm going to give a uh, an introduction to matroids and also to the Grassmannian. And then I'm gonna tell you about positive versions of both of these things. Um, I'll then tell you about a kind of non-crossing partition structure in positroids and also reliability. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit about tropical geometry, which sounds like it should be unrelated, but is actually uh, quite related. And then I will end by just mentioning a few applications in, in physics. So, okay, so what is a matroid? So a matroid is, is a combinatorial object which simultaneously generalizes the notion both of vectors in a vector space and also graphs. And this definition was pioneered in the 1930s. Um, so, so here's the definition. So a matroid M is an ordered pair E comma B where E is a finite set called the ground set and B is this non-empty collection of subsets of E, which are called bases, such that if you have two bases, B1 and B2, and then you take an element in B1 minus B2, there exists an element in B2 minus B1, such that you can remove B1 from your first basis and add in B2, and you'll get a new basis. And um, it's a fact that all bases have the same size, and this is called the rank of the matroid. Um, so this definition I've just given, I'll give some examples in a moment, but since this is um, the Tut lecture, I just want to mention that William Tut was one of the pioneers of graph theory and matroid theory. And his, his thesis, even his thesis was on matroid theory and over the course of his career, he made a great deal of, of contributions to the field. Okay, so here is just a review of the definition of matroid. And now I want to give some examples. So first of all, if E is a collection of vectors spanning a vector space, and script B is the collection of subsets of E forming a basis of V. So for example, here, E is this set of vectors labeled A, B, C, D, E, and F, and script B are the, the following three element subsets, <clears throat> then E comma B um, satisfies the definition of being a matroid. So this is kind of the prototypical example that most people think of when they think of matroid. Um, a second um, very um, important example is that if G is a graph with edge set E and script B is the spanning forests of G. So here's, a, here's um, my second example. This is um, a graph and I've labeled the edges A through F. And then you can look at all collections of edges, which form a, in this case, a spanning tree. So there's A, B, C, that's A, B, and C. And this is, this is a spanning tree of this graph, but there's a number of others. And the collection of all these spanning trees um, uh, is, is uh, script B and E comma B, again, is a matroid. So a matroid is this combinatorial object that simultaneously generalizes um, vectors together with their bases and um, graphs together with spanning forests. 
Okay, so I want to tell you about a very nice way to recognize metroids. And it, this, this um, method uses polytopes. So the question is, how can you tell if a collection of subsets is the basis of a metroid? And we'll use polytopes to answer this question. So let's let bracket n be the set of numbers, 1 through n. And I'm going to let e sub i be this um, unit vector with a 1 in the i-th position and zeros elsewhere. And now for b, so this is a, a set, b1 through bk, this is a subset of 1 through n. We'll let e sub capital B be the sum of the unit vectors corresponding to the elements in capital B. So this is like the indicator vector for the set B. Then we define the matroid polytope associated to a matroid, the matroid M, to be the convex hull of, the convex hull of all of these indicator vectors corresponding to the bases of M. And um, so, so B, again, is a K element subset of 1 through N. And E sub B is a 0, 1 vector in Rn, which has a 1 precisely in positions corresponding to capital B. And now for every basis in M, I take the convex hull of E sub B. And this is the definition of the matroid polytope. So here's a small example. M, is, um, M has ground set 1, 2, 3, and 4. And script B is the collection of two element subsets, 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4, 2, 3, and 2, 4. And then you can draw all of these indicator vectors for my five elements in B. So E12, for example, is 1, 1, 0, 0. And then if you take the convex hull of these um, five points, you get the pyramid that I've shown. So that's the matroid polytope in this case. And there's a beautiful old theorem due to Gelfond, Goreski, McPherson, and Serganova, which says the following. So let's let B be, the, be a collection of K element subsets of 1 through N. So I'm not assuming that B is the basis of the matroid. But nevertheless, let's take the convex hull of the indicator vectors corresponding to every B in my collection. Then E comma B is a matroid if and only if, when I look at this polytope I've constructed, every edge is parallel to EI minus EJ for some I and J. So if I look at any edge of the polytope and I look at the vector from one vertex to another, it's going to have exactly one one and exactly one minus one, and the rest of the coordinates are zero. So this gives a really nice geometric way to test whether or not a collection of subsets is the basis of a matroid. Okay, <clears throat> so, um, so remember our, our first kind of prototypical example of matroid is a matroid coming from vectors spanning a vector space. And such a matroid is called realizable. Now it's definitely not the case that all matroids are realizable. So for example, there's a famous matroid called the non-Pappus matroid. And here's, here's the example. So my ground set E is going to be um, the set of nine points that I've drawn in the plane and labeled A through I. And then notice I've, I've drawn a bunch of lines connecting points. Um, and uh, <clears throat> in particular, I've drawn all lines which contain three, three points, except I have not drawn the line through G, H, and I. I've deliberately not drawn the black line con containing G, H, and I. And now I will define my matroid to be E comma B, where B is all three element subsets that do not lie on a black line. Because these three points on a line represents like dependence, affine dependence, as opposed to independence. Now, um, sorry. I meant to say, um, E comma B is in fact a matroid, but it doesn't come from vectors in a vector space, preci precisely because um, it violates a, a Pappus theorem from Euclidean geometry. Okay, so it's very natural to ask, can one characterize which matroids are realizable? And if you're talking about matroids realizable by vectors over a finite field, um, 
there was work um, from 2013, Gielen, Gerards, and Riddle, um, who proved Rhoda's 1970 conjecture that there are finitely many obstructions to realizability over a finite field FQ. Now, over a field of characteristic zero, this is um, considered to be intractable. And Vamos famously wrote in 1978, the missing axiom of mutual theory is lost forever. And, um, and basically gave, I mean, proved a rigorous statement saying in which, in which sense it, <clears throat> it's impossible to characterize realizable matroids staying within kind of the realm of matroid theory. Okay, so now I want to talk about um, a geometric object called the Grassmannian. So the real Grassmannian, GRK and of R, is the set of all vector spaces in Rn, which have dimension K. And we'll represent elements of the Grassmannian by full rank K by N matrices A. And then you can think of, of the Grassmannian <clears throat> as full rank matrices modulo the equivalence, um, where you say that two K by N matrices are equivalent if they span the same K dimensional subspace. So here's an example of a full rank two by four matrix. So we can think of this as representing an element of the Grassmannian of two planes in four space. Um, so now I just want to review the Plucker coordinates on the Grassmannian. So again, bracket N will be the set of numbers one through N. And now given I, a K element subset of one through N, the Plucker coordinate P sub I of A is defined to be the minor, the determinant of the K by K submatrix of A located in columns I. So I'm gonna label my columns <clears throat> one through N from left to right. So we label our columns one, two, three, and four. Then P one, two is the determinant of this submatrix, which is negative one. So that's why P one, two is negative one. And then we can go through and compute the rest of the Plucker coordinates, which are labeled by the two element subsets of one through four. Okay, so um, if, uh, if V is a Grassmannian element represented by a K by N matrix A, I can also think about the matroid that is realized by the column vectors of A. So V gives rise to a matroid that we'll call M sub V. And <clears throat> the ground set is one through N, which I'm thinking of as the columns of my K by N matrix. And script B, my bases, will be all K element subsets of one through N, where the corresponding Pluger coordinate is non-zero. In other words, the corresponding K element subset of my column vectors are independent. So for my matrix A in this example, my ground set is one, two, three, and four, and my bases will be precisely the two element subsets, one, two, one, four, two, three, two, four, and three, four, where my Pluger coordinates were non-vanishing. Okay, so this is just a review of the definition of Grassmannian and the matroid that I associate to any element in the Grassmannian. So now since every Grassmannian element gives rise to a matroid, we can subdivide the Grassmannian into pieces based on which matroid arises. So given a, a rank K matroid M on one through N, we'll let S of N be the set of all elements in the Grassmannian, which give rise to this, this given matroid M. So of course, SM will be empty if M is not a realizable matroid. And this subset of the Grassmannian S of M is called a matroid stratum. Um, so, um, so, we, so we've partitioned the Grassmannian into pieces, into these matroid strata, and this is called the matroid stratification, and the study was first initiated by Gelfon, Gresky, McPherson, and Serganova. So just to say it in another way, we're partitioning the Grassmannian into pieces based on which Pluger coordinates are non-zero. So this is, again, just a review of my notation. 
So a few years after um, GGMS introduced the Metroid stratification, Mignoff proved this famous universality theorem. And what he proved, roughly speaking, is that the topology of the Metroid stratum SM can be as complicated as that of any algebraic variety. So in other words, the topology of these Metroid strata is very bad. And if you want a precise statement, you can look at my footnote. But just think of this as saying that the matrix strata are topologically very complicated. And uh, his universality theorem <coughs> was picked up by Ravi Bakil, who wrote a paper called Murphy's Law and Algebraic Geometry, Badly Behaved Deformation Spaces. So it's, it's useful to know that these matrix strata are bad. We have a question in the chat. Question in the chat? Oh. Yeah. Let's see. Um, Josh Lamb asks, why do we take the real Grassmannian? Oh, so yeah, that's a good question. We don't have to take the real Grassmannian. We could also talk about the complex Grassmannian. But for where I'm going, which is positivity, um, I want to be talking about reals. But much of, much of what I say, we could, we could be using um, a different field. OK. So the summary is that uh, matroids are complicated. Uh, many of them are not realizable. And even when they are, in other words, they correspond to a matroid stratum in the Grassmannian, the topology of the matroid strata is complicated. OK, so somehow that's the summary. Life is complicated. Now um, I want to look at a positive analog of everything I've said so far. And this is just a review of the notions and my notation for Grassmannian and Pluger coordinates. So now the totally non-negative Grassmannian, so the study here was initiated um, sort of independently by Postnikov, Lustig, Riesch, um, and was followed up by many other people. So the totally non-negative Grassmannian, GRKN, and I have this not greater than or equal to symbol, is the subset of the real Grassmannian where Pluger coordinates are all non-negative. So here's a two by four matrix, and we can compute all of its Pluger coordinates. And I've chosen an example so that all Pluger coordinates are non-negative. So the, the space of all Grassmannian elements with non-negative Pluger coordinates is called the totally non-negative or TNN Grassmannian. So now, um, just as we looked at the um, matroid stratification of the Grassmannian before, we can look at um, the analog for the positive for this totally non-negative Grassmannian. So given a matroid M, we can let SM TNN be the set of all elements in the TNN Grassmannian, which give rise to our fixed matroid M. And if this set is non-empty, then we call it a positroid stratum. And the matroids M where um, SMTNN is non-empty are called positroids. So these are precisely the matroids that can be realized by matrices where simultaneously all Pluker coordinates are non-negative. So um, this gives us a way of decomposing the TNN Grassmannian into pieces, into these positroid strata. So we're, we're partitioning the TNN Grassmannian based on which matroids are realized or equivalently based on which Pluger coordinates are non-zero. We're saying, let's let this fixed set of Pluger coordinates be non-zero, in, in this case positive, and all the rest have to be zero. So now recall that the matrix strata of the Grassmannian are very bad. That was Mignoff's universality theorem. Now in contrast, every positroid stratum is a cell, meaning it's homeomorphic to an open ball. So this was proved by Postnikov in his um, in this preprint from 2006. So somehow the behavior is completely different when you go from, from matroid strata of the real Grassmannian to positroid strata of the TNN Grassmannian. Okay, so this is just a review of the notation. And furthermore, Postnikov classified when um, these positroid strata are non-empty, and he showed that these non-empty cells and in, hence the rank K positroids are in bijection with various combinatorial objects. 
So decorated permutations is one of the things labeling these cells, one of the things labeling these rank key positroids. Another is some kind of tableau called Le diagrams. And another is equivalence classes of some kind of planar um, bicolored graphs. So these are graphs on a circle, they're planar, and uh, sorry, they're graphs embedded in a disk, I should say. And um, internal vertices have one of two colors. There are some questions in the chat, I think. Oh, okay. Um, let's see. Yeah, each cell is an open ball. And yeah, I'm talking about, yeah, so I'm, I'm talking about something that is um, just homeomorphic to an open ball, um, you know, like an open interval um, in the usual topology. Okay, um, so now I want to say something about the structure of positroids. So let's recall a matroid is called a positroid if it comes from a point of the TNN Grassmannian. So in other words, how do we construct a positroid? You start with a K by N matrix where maximal minors or Pfluger coordinates are all non-negative. You let your ground set be the numbers one through N. These are the columns of your matrix. And your bases B are the K element subsets I where P sub I of A, the Pfluger coordinate is strictly positive. And then um, bracket N comma B is, is by definition a positroid. Um, we have one more question from the uh, chat. Oh, okay. Um, uh, how do I find that again? The, the question is, why are the Plucker coordinates based on minors? Why not some other property of the submatrix, such as condition number? Is there something special about the determinant? Oh, um, well, I guess maybe over the course of this talk, we're going to see there's some very special things um, about, these, about these maximal minors. Well, I mean, one reason is that even for the ordinary Grassmannian, the Pfluger coordinates give an embedding of the Grassmannian into projective space. So that's, that's one reason. Um, okay, so let's let M and N be matroids on ground sets E and F. Then the, the direct sum of our matroids M and N is, is defined to be the matroid on the disjoint union of E and F, where bases are precisely the disjoint union of a basis for your first matroid and a basis of your second matroid. Okay, so this is, this is our notion of direct sum for matroids. And if a matroid is not, cannot be written as the direct sum of two non-empty matroids, then you say it's connected. Now let me give one more definition. A non-crossing partition um, of one through n is a disjoint union of sets called S sub i, where we're viewing the numbers one through n on a circle. And we require that the convex hull of S i and S j are disjoint for all i not equal to j. So this is an example of a non-crossing partition of the numbers one through 10 into the four sets that I've shown here. And so you can see for each set, like for example, for two, nine, and 10, on my circle, I drew the convex hull of those points. And now you can see from our picture that none of the black convex hulls overlap each other. So this is called non-crossing partition. So there's a nice um, structure theorem for positroids, which we proved with Federico Ardila and Felipe Rincon. So if M is a positroid on one through N, um, let's let S1 through ST be the ground sets of the connected components of M, then S1 through ST is a non-crossing partition. And conversely, if S1 through ST is a non-crossing partition of one through N, and M1 through MT are connected positroids on S1 through ST, then the direct sum of positroids M1 through MT is again a positroid. So basically, the, the not, there's, a, there's a beautiful non-crossing partition structure in positroids um, that you obtain when you look at the connected components. And um, of course, I'm not gonna give any proofs in this talk, but I'll just say a few reasons why the theorem is true. And one reason is that there's a circular symmetry in the TNN Grassmannian. 
And by that, I mean that if V1 through Vn are columns of a K by N, TNN matrix, then you can cyclically wrap them around. So V2 through Vn, comma, and now I'm putting plus or minus V1 at the far end. Um, this is again, the columns of a TNN matrix. So there's a circular symmetry um, inherent in this object. And there's also a planar structure in this object, um, which um, I guess I didn't really explain, but I mentioned this result of Kosnikov that cells can be put in bijection with equivalence classes of some kinds of planar bicolor graphs. So somehow there's a circular symmetry and a planar structure in the TNN Grassmannian. And all of that comes into the fact that um, there's this non-crossing partition structure when you look at connected components. Okay, so now um, I want to go to the matroid polytopes. So recall that we can characterize when a collection of subsets is the basis of a matroid by looking at the convex hull of their indicator vectors. And um, when B is the basis of a matroid M, this is called the matroid polytope. Um, now we can also use this matroid polytope to characterize exactly when your matroid is a positroid. So given two positive numbers I, I and J in one through N, we'll let I comma J be the cyclic interval between I and J. So that means cyclic interval on a circle. In other words, if I is less than J, the cyclic interval is just the usual thing, i, i plus one, dot, 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 up to j. But if i is bigger than j, then your cyclic interval is i, i plus one, dot, dot, dot. You go all the way up to n, and then you start, start over, one, two, up through j. And, <clears throat> and again, with Federico Ardila and Felipe Rincon, we proved that a matroid M is a positroid if and only if its matroid polytope can be described first of all, by this trivial equality, the sum of the x i's is k, that's just coming from the fact that we have rank k, but also inequalities of the following form. And the, the, the thing to point out here um, is that these facet inequalities all have support, um, which are cyclic intervals. So if, you, if you're looking at a matroid and you want to know if it's a matroid, if it's a if it's a positroid, you can look at its matroid polytope and just see if the facets have this form. So now let me go to the question of realizability. So recall that many matroids are not realizable. Now, by the way I defined them, positroids are automatically realizable because I defined them to come from the TNN Grassmannian. Um, but there is a realizability question we can ask. And first, I need to say a few things about Pluker relations. So let's let A be a K by N matrix. And I'll choose four ordered numbers, A, B, C, and D. And additionally, I'll choose a K minus two element subset of one through N that I call capital T. Now, there are many relations satisfied by the K by K minors of a K by N matrix. Um, there's many, um, these are called Pluker relations. And one example of the Pluker relations is the three term Pluker relation. And so let me, so this is a picture to help you remember what's the three term Pluker relation associated to A, B, C, D, and T. So let's put A, B, C, D as vertices of a quadrilateral. Then my three term Pluker relation says that P A C T times P B D T. So this is like A C times B D equals A B times C D plus A D times B C. So this is like the Ptolemy formula. Um, so this is so this is a three-term Pluck relation, and this is one of many of the relations that are satisfied by the k by k minors of a k by n matrix. And if you look at our two by four example, then you'll see in this case that p13, p24 equals p12, 
plus P14, P23. Okay, so this is just a reminder of our three-term Fluke relation. And now there's a structure um, called an oriented matroid, which is a refinement of the notion of matroid. It just encodes a little bit of extra information that corresponds, for example, um, to the sign of um, a determinant. So if you're looking at a collection of vectors, like V1 through Vn, the structure of a matroid keeps track of when k of these vectors um, form a basis, but the oriented matroid data will additionally keep track of whether um, your determinants are positive, negative, or zero. Lauren, uh, sorry to interrupt, we have a question from the chat. Let's see, is there also a characterization of a collection of flats of positroids in terms of cyclic intervals? Oh, um, that's a good question. I don't know offhand about the flats, but I, yeah, I haven't thought about it too much, but yeah, I don't know offhand. Um, okay, so, so this oriented matroid keeps track of signs and abstractly, the way you define oriented matroid is that it's a pair consisting of our ground set one through n together with this function chi called the chirotope. This is the thing that's like keeping track of the sign of your determinant. So it's a function from a k element subset of your ground set. Actually, it's not a function from a k element subset of the ground set. It's a function which takes values on ordered k element um, tuples of your ground set and spits out plus or minus one or zero. And this is the thing which um, generalizes um, sign of a determinant. And um, so it has an alternating property. And then it also has this um, condition, which let's just think of as the combinatorial consequence of three-term Pluca relations. And um, yeah, so it's, if you think about the three-term Pluca relation, for a few minutes, then you might see that this is what I've written down here for this second bullet, bullet point um, is a natural kind of generalization of that. But don't worry, don't worry about the precise statement. Okay, so again, this is um, a recap of the definition of oriented matroid. And now we'll say that an oriented matroid is positively oriented if whenever you look at this ordered set, I1 through IK of one through N, then the chirotope applied to I1 through IK is either positive or it's zero. Okay, so De Silva conjectured back in 1987 that every positively oriented matroid is realizable. And, um, and we proved this a few years ago with Ardila and Rincon. So we proved every positively oriented matroid is realizable, or in other words, every positively oriented matroid comes from a positroid, i.e. comes from a K by N matrix with maximal minors non-negative. And again, I don't wanna talk about proofs really, but I'll just say that um, the proof involves reducing to the case of connected oriented matroids and using this kind of nice characterization of positroids in terms of their polytopes. So the kind of rough summary of what we've seen is that positroids are much nicer than matroids. Um, the topology of a matroid stratum is very complicated, but a positroid stratum is always a cell. Many matroids are not realizable, but all positively oriented matroids are. Okay, so now, I want to sort of shift gears a little bit um, and just say a few words about tropical geometry. So roughly speaking, tropical geometry is the study of polynomials and their geometric properties when you replace addition by the min operation and you replace multiplication by plus. So you could tropicalize the polynomial x squared plus 3xy plus y cubed by replacing it with the min of x plus x, comma, three plus x plus y, comma, y plus y plus y. And one reason 
that people have studied tropical geometry is that um, you can map um, an algebraic variety to a tropical counterpart. And this um, tropical counterpart generally has, um, you know, this, this mapping preserves some geometric information about the original. And um, explicitly, you can, you can construct tropical varieties by defining ordinary varieties over the field of Puissot series and applying the valuation map. So I'll just explain how we would do this for the Grassmannian. Okay, so what do I mean by Puissot series? So script C is going to be um, my notation for Puissot series. And these are be going to be some kind of power series in one variable T and exponents will be rational. And furthermore, every power series I consider must have a leading term, meaning um, there exists a term with a minimal exponent. So I'll denote my leading term by lambda t to the u, and u is, um, is the smallest exponent that appears. to the minus 9.5 plus 3t to the minus 2 plus t to the 7.28, then valuation of f is negative 9.5. Okay, so now um, the study of the tropical Grassmannian was initiated by Speyer and Sturmfels around 2005, and this is how we define it. So given a generic k by n full rank matrix a of t, we're now I'm working over Puissot series, so my entries are Puissot series. We're going to map A of t to, um, to a vector in R to the n choose k by applying the valuation map to all the Pluger coordinates. So, if, so here's a matrix A where, where entries are Puissot series. You can compute all of the Pluger coordinates in the usual way. So P12 is t to the 3 halves. And then we can compute the rest of our, our Pluger coordinates. And now we, we take the valuation of each Pluger coordinate. So remember, remember, we're looking at the smallest exponent that occurs. And so we get this tuple of real numbers, 3 halves, comma 3, comma 9, comma negative 1 half, comma 9 halves, comma 6. And now what's the tropical Grassmannian? Well, all you do is you, you look at the set of all real vectors you get by starting with one of these matrices of a Puissot series, taking the Pluger coordinates, and then applying the valuation map. So this gives us a whole bunch of um, rational vectors, and then you take the closure. And that's the tropical Grassmannian. Okay, so it sounds a little bit weird and maybe scary if you see it for the first time, um, but it turns out to have a lot of very nice structure. Um, and I want to tell you about um, what happens when, you're, when you throw in the adjective positive. Okay, so recall, um, recall that if f of t is a Puissot series with leading term lambda t to the u, its valuation is just u. And now if that leading term has positive coefficient lambda, then we say that our Puissot series is positive, right? So um, these positive Puissot series are the analog of positive real numbers within the field of real numbers. They form a monoid. Um, that's, one, that's one property closed under addition and also multiplication. So for example, 2t to the negative 1 minus 3 2t squared is a positive Puissot series, because if I look at my leading term, that first coefficient is 2. But on the other hand, um, this is not a positive Puissot series, because the coefficient of the leading term is negative. Okay, so, um, so Speyer and I studied the positive tropical Grassmannian. And um, so just as before, what we do is, is we map 
a matrix over Priso series to R to the n choose k by applying valuation to the Pflugger coordinates. Um, but now, um, the only matrices that we want to consider are those where the Pflugger coordinates are positive. So notice that my leading coefficients in this example are all positive. They're, they're mostly one, so I didn't write them. Um, and here's three. So, so all, of, all of our Pflugger coordinates are positive Pliso series. And, um, and now the positive tropical Grassmannian is defined the same as before. You look at all of these um, k by n matrices over, over Puiseau series, but now we require Pluker coordinates positive, positive Puiseau series, and then you take the valuation, and then you look at the closure of this set. Okay, so it sounds probably awfully complicated, um, but I want to explain that it's actually um, much simpler than you might expect. So while points of the of the Grassmannian and also the TNN Grassmannian satisfy Pluker relations, so for example, we saw the three-term Pluker relation, points of the positive tropical Grassmannian satisfy tropical analogs of these relations. So for example, this is the positive tropical three-term Pluker relation, and I've written it so that you can see exactly how parallel these relations are to the original three-term Pluker relation, right? The left-hand side of, of these two bullet points looks, um, you know, contains the same terms that you see here. Um, but these are kind of piecewise linear versions of the three-term, I mean, this is like a, a piecewise linear version of the three-term Pluker relations. And, um, and one can check explicitly in this example that um, the positive tropical three-term relation holds. So what it's saying really is that um, if you look at the sum of coordinates here, um, then this is, so that's what I have on the left-hand side, it's equal to either this, the sum of coordinates here or the sum of coordinates here and that in turn is less than or equal to the other. So I'll, I'll say more about these relations in a moment. Um, and in fact, um, they have a very pretty uh, interpretation in terms of um, metric planar trees. So, um, right, for, for the Grassmannian of two plans in space, the positive tropical three-term Pflugger relations can be interpreted precisely as negatives of distances between leaves on metric planar trees. So I'll show a picture on the next slide. And I want to also have right there the, the positive tropical three-term Pflugger relation. So let me just um, consider a tree on four leaves. A, B, C, D. And I'm labeling the leaves A, B, C, D in clockwise order. Now there's two combinatorial types of such a tree when I'm talking about four leaves. And this is the other combinatorial type. And now if I start looking, if I, if I think of these trees as having, um, being metric trees, having distances, then I can look at the distance, let's say the distance between vertices A and C. So I really mean, you know, add up the lengths here. And if you look at the distance between vertices A and C, leaves A and C, and you add it to the distance between B and D, this will be equal to the length between A and D plus the distance between B and C, and that'll be bigger than the distance between A and B plus the distance between C and D. And if I go to my other example, if I look at the distance between A and C, and I add to it the distance between B and D, that's equal to the distance between A and B plus the distance between C and D, and that's bigger than the distance between A and D plus the distance between B and C. And if I were looking at a degenerate tree where this length here shrunk to zero, I would have an inequality. And now if you make your distances negative, well, sorry, if you, if you negate the, the distances, 
then you get precisely this positive tropical three-term fluke relation. And so that's why um, the positive tropical Grassmannian of two planes in N space is precisely the space of planar metric trees on N vertices labeled one through N in cyclic order. Okay, so positive tropical G2N is very, very nice. It's just the space of trees. Now for GKN, we don't have trees anymore, but there's still a simple description and, um, and it's sort of the straightforward algebraic generalization. Um, positive tropical GKN is precisely the set of points P sub I, think of these as tropical Pluger coordinates, which satisfy all the positive tropical three-term Pluger relations. And, um, and I just want to make a remark that this theorem is a little bit surprising um, for GKN, and that's because, so the positive tropical three-term Pluger relations came from three-term Pluger relations, but for general Grassmannians, GKN, there are many more Pluger relations than just the three-term Pluger relations. And so that's why you would expect the description of positive tropical Grassmannian to be a little bit more complicated. You'd expect to see more, more relations, but in fact, these three-term ones cut it out. Okay. Um, so I talked before about uh, matroid polytopes and positroid polytopes, and now I want to just explain how the positive tropical Grassmannian is connected to that world. So recall that the matroid polytope of a matroid is the convex hull of all of the vectors, all the zero one vectors, E sub B, where B is a basis of our matroid. And um, if M is the uniform matroid of rank K, what that means is that um, B is all K element subsets of one through N, then gamma M is a polytope known as the hypersimplex delta KN, which is the convex hull of all E sub I, where I is a K element subset. So this figure here shows delta two, four. Um, so of course, by definition, or it follows from definitions immediately, that for any, so if M is a rank K matroid on one through N, then its matroid polytope has to be contained in delta KN, because its vertices are just a subset of the vertices of the hypersimplex. So a natural question to ask is when do a collection of positroid polytopes fit together to give a, a subdivision of the hypersimplex? So we can just look at our small example here. Um, and it's, um, it's a simple exercise to verify that there are three ways of subdividing delta 2, 4 into two full dimensional matroid polytopes. And you're really just cutting it um, into two um, square pyramids. So there's, there's, three, there's three planes along which you can cut it into two pyramids. And two of these subdivisions are positroidal. And they are exactly the ones that I indicated in this picture. You can either split along this plane here, or you can split along this plane here. And then my claim is that uh, this is a splitting of delta 2, 4 into positroid polytopes. And just as a preview, um, this number two, this number of subdivisions, which is two, is related to the fact that there are two planar trees on four beta vertices labeled in cyclic order. They were the two that I showed before. So these numbers two are the same. Okay, so um, if one's interested in subdivisions of polytopes, then there's a common, there's a there's an important technique of using height functions to come up with subdivisions of polytopes. And I'll just explain how that works for the hypersimplex. So for every vertex E sub i of delta Kn, we're going to choose a real number, P sub i, which we call its height. And then we're going to lift the hypersimplex into space of dimension one higher. So the hypersimplex was previously living in Rn, and now we're going to put it into Rn plus one. Well, we're, we're, we're putting a related polytope into Rn plus one by looking at the convex hull of all of the vectors E sub i comma P sub i. So E sub i is this zero one vector with ones precisely in positions capital I, and P sub i is just a single real number, which we're calling the height 
of E sub i. So this gives a, a polytope in R to the n plus one. And now you can project the lower faces of this convex hull back down to um, the hypersimplex. And this gives a subdivision of, of the hypersimplex. And you can ask, when will this subdivision be a subdivision into positroid polytopes? So this is a theorem that we proved with um, Thomas Lukowski and Matteo Parisi. And it says the following. So let's let P be a vector. So each component is called P sub i, and this is a vector in R to the n choose k. So I'm thinking of this vector as our heights for our n choose k vertices of the hypersimplex. Then the following statements are equivalent. The first statement is that P lies in the positive tropical Grassmannian. In other words, it satisfies all the positive tropical free term Pflugerrelations. relations. And the second statement is that every face of the subdivision is a positroid polytope. Um, so this is a, so this theorem is really saying that the positive tropical Grassmannian is controlling the positroidal subdiv subdivisions of the hypersimplex. And um, the theorem is a positive analog of an earlier result of Speyer from 2005, which was somehow anticipated by Kapranov. And I think the theorem was anticipated or known by a number of, of others, but it wasn't written down until, until quite recently. Um, and um, one nice thing about this theorem is that um, we can use it to give a new proof. So the new proof is together with Spire of the theorem that every positively oriented matroid is realizable. And um, somehow the idea is that given a positively oriented matroid M, you can construct a related um, like height vector, which, which is related to M and also lies in the positive tropical Grassmannian. And one can show that since it lies in the positive tropical Grassmannian, every face of the subdivision corresponds to a realizable matroid. Um, another nice thing about these positroidal subdivisions is that they have very nice numerology. So you might ask, um, if you're looking at a positroidal subdivision, how many maximal dimension well, positroid polytopes will appear? Or how many faces of, of any dimension will appear? And Spire studied this question um, um, for, for vectors coming from the tropical Grassmannian, though he proved in 2009, if P is a vector coming from the um, arising as valuations of Pluker coordinates of a matrix over a Poisson series, then your corresponding um, matroid subdivision will have at most this nice number of faces of each dimension. And he gave a condition for equality. Um, and we showed that every finest positroidal subdivision of delta Kn, that means any positroidal subdivision that can't be further cut up to get a positroidal subdivision. Um, so each of these finest ones achieve precisely this bound above. So such a positroidal subdivision has always has n minus two choose k minus one full dimensional polytopes. Okay, so anyway, upshot is that we have nice numerology. Um, so the, the summary is that positroids are very nice. Um, the topology of, of positroid strata um, is very simple. Um, many matroids are not realizable, but all positively oriented matroids are. Um, these things can be characterized by their matroid polytopes. And the positive tropical Grassmannian has a very nice description and it controls positroidal subdivisions of the hypersimplex. And, um, and um, so, so I think it's a very nice theory, but um, additionally, positroids and tropical Grassmannian, trop, tro the tropical Grassmannian, um, also have applications to um, physics and shallow water waves. So I'll just take one minute for each of these applications, just to say that um, um, physicists studying scattering amplitudes in N equals four super Yang mills connected um, the geometry of the positive Grassmannian to scattering amplitudes. Um, 
So, um, and in particular, I want to mention that Arkani Hamid and Trinka introduced an object called the amplitudehedron, um, whose subdivisions can be used to compute scattering amplitudes. And um, surprisingly, um, Lukowski and Parisi and I found that the tropical positive Grassmannian also is related to um, good subdivisions of the amplitudehedron. So for some reason, which we don't entirely understand, it also seems to control subdivisions of the amplitudehedron. Um, and there's also been work of Pichazzo, Early, Rivera, Misera, and actually many other physicists connecting um, the tropical Grassmannian and its positive analog to, to um, certain scalar theories. Okay, so all of these things have been studied intensively in the re in recent years. And, um, and finally, these objects are also connected to shallow water waves by the KP equation. And um, so just to say two sentences about how this works, every point in the totally non-negative Grassmannian gives rise to um, a solution of the KP equation. And these solutions are, are said to model shallow water waves, like beach waves, like the photo shows. And one can um, approximate these solutions using tropical curves. In particular, you can, you can look at where the waves have their peak. And, um, and this winds up being a tropical curve. And the behavior can be analyzed using the combinatorics of, of positroids. This is something that Yuji Kodam and I studied um, a few years ago. So, um, so the point is, positroids and tropical geometry is very nice. And, um, and has applications to, to a lot of um, unexpected fields. So I'll just end um, by putting up some of the references. And uh, thanks, thanks very much. Thank you very much, Lauren, for a very nice talk. Um, we have some time for questions. And uh, just in the last minute or so, there was a question in the, in the group chat. And so maybe that would be uh, a, a good first question to start off with. Oh, yes. Fact, what I was going to suggest is that uh, maybe um, at this point, if, if you do have a question, we can just try to uh, have people unmute themselves uh, when there's a moment you know, to ask a question and, and then uh, just ask it uh, in words. Um, so the, the first question was from Argya Sadukan, who asks, do we have a parallel story for flag variety instead of the Grassmannian? Or more generally yeah. for G yeah, C for classical G. Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, so, so there are analogs of um, all of these. Well, okay, those analogs of many of these objects for the complete flag variety and for G mod P. Um, there's a analog of the totally non-negative Grassmannian for any G mod P. This was first studied by Lustig. Um, there are um, Let's see, in terms of tropical geometry, um, some people have been studying the tropical flag variety and the positive counterpart. Um, I think I've seen work of Leon Zhang and, and collaborators on, um, on some of that. Um, one can talk about, um, instead of talking about matroid polytopes, one can talk about um, coxter matroids and coxter matroid polytopes. And, um, and uh, let's see, I guess I have a, I have a paper with Emmanuel Sukerman called Bruja Interval Polytopes. And these are really about the, um, about the Coxeter analog of positroid polytopes. So um, yeah, so, um, so some of this has been worked out in other cases, but the picture is less complete for the flag variety and for, and for Gmod P in general. Are there other questions for Lauren? Is there a generalization of positroids for which the strata are not just cells? Oh, um, so there is, let's see. So I guess it depends on what you mean by generalization of positroid. Um, so the way Lust, so Lustig, Lustig defined um, the totally non-negative part of G mod P, um, which includes the complete flag variety and partial flag varieties, 
and he conjectured a cell decomposition, which was proved by Constance Reach. And, um, and so in particular, these strata will be cells. But on the other hand, there are also, um, let's see, there's also um, slightly other versions of matroid and positroid stratification. So in particular, there's a something called the Diodar stratification of the Grassmannian. Um, and, um, this is a stratification of the real Grassmannian or actually the Grassmannian over any field. Um, and your strata will end up looking, being isomorphic to something like, so if it's over R, um, they'll have this form. So, um, so they won't really, they won't be cells because in general, A could be non-zero, um, but it's still a fairly, it's still a fairly nice um, topologic structure. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. Oh, okay, I see there's another question in the chat. Does the realizability results mean there's a missing axiom for which matroids are positroids? Oh, um, yeah, um, yeah, I guess so. Um, I mean, the easiest way for me to answer that, uh, which might not be precisely what you're looking for, would be to say that the, um, would be to say that the matroid polytope has to have the structure where facets are cut out by these cyclic inequalities. Um, there might be a way to translate that into something that sound that that's more, I don't know, that, that's more in the language of of matroid theory. Um, but yeah, I think there's there's a number of ways where you can characterize which matroids are positroids. Um, but the easiest easiest one for me would be to go via the matroid polytope. Okay. Um... Last chance for one final question for Lauren. If not, um, let's thank Lauren again. Uh, and um, the uh, the we will uh, will now end the talk portion of uh, this afternoon, and uh, we'll continue with the. Uh, the discussion and uh, social uh, event of the virtual grad house. So Lauren, if you could uh, designate me as, as the host. Oh yes, I will do that. Um, 